So a few of you know me. My name is Michael Godek. I'm from a small town in Texas, just east of San Antonio. I'm originally from the Green Mountains of Vermont, uh, just south of Cavendish, if you know the area there. Uh, I'm a programmer, I'm a publisher, um, I'm a systems engineer, and my practice area is in sorting out software systems in terms of services. I've been through a, a lot of frameworks and methodologies over the years, and recently I was studying the KMM while working with a client who was in the process of adopting the um, Scaled Agile framework. So I just wanted to share some of my reflections on that experience with you here today. So thanks for coming out. I hope that you get some value out of it. Um, first, the, I'll have to ask you to um, go through the disclaimer. Um, it was a really talented team. Uh, we started with the highest of hopes. It was a greenfield project, and we weren't going to be bound by any rigid process. Uh, there were very high expectations, and we felt that we were destined for great things. I'll spare you the details, because if you stop and reflect for just a moment on your own experience with these sorts of things, you probably already know where we were headed. Uh, it's true that our ad hoc agile had devolved into a patchwork of poorly defined initiatives, unrealistic expectations, and missed deadlines. And considering our weekly burn rate, we knew it couldn't go on like that forever. But somehow it felt like there would always be time to reform. Uh, for the longest time, management made no obvious attempt to staunch the bleeding. But all the while, they were preparing their move. With the kind of results we were giving them, they had little choice but to act. The problem was seen as insufficient planning. And so planning, plenty of it, was seen as a solution. Uh, they brought in uh, change agent contractors to train executives, managers, and leaders on customer centricity and how to assemble agile release trains. Implementation plans were drawn up, release train schedules prepared. Coaches and servant leaders indoctrinated the willing and the weak alike. Outposts of the new culture were established at strategic points throughout the organization. One could recognize the zealots by their excited cries of weighted short a job first and muffled whispers about program increment milestones. We listened in awe as management called for a spike into the spanning palette, waxing eloquent on the critical importance of the architectural runway. When it got to the part about leveraging the solutions backlog to get everyone on the agile train, I had to pinch myself just to make sure it wasn't just a bad dream. In days of old, enterprise software teams wandered aimlessly for many moons, and even the IT chieftain knew not of a safe haven. Then Schwaber and Sutherland came out of the, to lead the tribes out of the desert to a new land of milk and scrum. In this land of dogged persistence and incremental accomplishment, the ancient muddy ritual of rugby was consecrated to a new era of software development. The mere mention of Kanban was understood as disloyal subversion. The pressure was on to be seen as a team player. Aaron Burr's advice to Hamilton came to mind. Talk less, smile more. Don't let them know what you're against or what you're for. The hegemony of safe culture was uncontested. I retreated into my requirements hidey hole as masters fresh out of scrum school preached the gospel of sprint commitments and the re-education programs that awaited those that couldn't live up to their sprintly pledges. The hellfire of burn downs became the daily catechism and velocity was measured with the spirit of the alchemists of old pursuing the secret of forging gold from lead. Certified safe change agents came as apostles of a great and undisputed faith, speaking of the benefits that would accrue to those who acted in accordance to canonical practice, of a day when agile trains would run on time, of a future at astonishing scale. The way ahead would be a road paved in best practices. The cultural tsunami that had engulfed the organization didn't quite reach the high ground where the, at, at the pull request edge. Right? The pull request edge is a sort of 
no man's land where theory and practice occasionally meet under the flag of truce. Hey, long time no see, how you been? How many little pull requests do you have underfoot these days? Really? That many? You devil. The mere mention of some sideways shit that's blocking a release goes over about as well as an invitation to a diaper changing party. Oh my, how time flies. Hey, I've got to jump to another meeting, but really, we should do this more often. Meetings are the natural habitat of theory. Say what you will about the fine art of software process engineering, but you can't get away from the fact that it all comes down to releases. Releases made up of pull requests, pull request sets of commits, and in the end, it all comes down to the code. It brings to mind those immortal words of Yogi Bhatta that, in theory, there ain't no difference between theory and practice. But in practice, it turns out that there is. In practice, it's the code that's released to production that matters, not the meetings that you attended. So there was this yawning void between where the release trains were being assembled and the pull request edge, where old inventory was piling up. The station master heads down in Excel trying to figure out which train was coming, which one was going. A manager took me aside for ideas on what to do about, what, about the wreckage that our project had become. There was plenty of low-hanging fruit, but I had the presence of mind to answer nothing. Uh, I was thinking start from where you are, but my manager thought I was being sarcastic. Right? For once, I was in earnest. Uh, at first, we, we had the nearly irresistible urge to design the process that we thought should be. But we recognized that trying to engineer the outcome would likely meet with stiff opposition. So we soldiered on, visualizing the work, focusing on what was impeding the flow. When the topic of systems thinking came up, we looked at our problem through the lens of the Kanban maturity model. The KMM makes no presumption that intervention is somehow always the first thing you do to get the train back on track. You start by visualizing the work um, to help ensure that you actually understand what's going on, generally a good idea. And then you limit the working progress in order to drive the constraints to the surface. Only then do you consider policy and practice changes and only as a response to the problems that you actually have. And the model helps in making appropriate choices. Um, Nassim Taleb spoke about a systematic protocol to determine when to intervene and when to leave a system alone. The KMM doesn't insist on piling on practices, but rather provides meaningful guidance on how a company might mature incrementally. My colleague asked what maturity level I thought we were at. So I asked, um, do customers perceive service de delivery as unreliable? Um, is there an observable lack of alignment among teams? Is work being pushed into the system? So I resisted blurting out oblivious mode and instead observed that while there were certainly some things in our favor, we were still subject to the occasional regression under the stress of delivery. And that led to the question of what practices we should be looking to adopt. Like other maturity models, the KMM helps guide and practice adoption, but with the critical distinction that practice adoption is not a measure of success. The only real measure of success in an organization utilizing the KMM should be productivity. Now, many technology managers use the word productivity rather loosely. Often they really mean some local optimization along the lines of keeping everyone busy. Or perhaps they want to emphasize the importance of deadlines by equating productivity with performing according to their Gantt chart. Rarely do we find the word productivity used in the, in the context accompanied by Andy Grove's formulation of as measured by, or anything for that matter remotely in the direction of specificity. Kanban measures productivity in terms of throughput, and once you have a stable system, throughput can be measured reliably using Little's law. Now, we can argue about the meaning of productivity in terms of additional measurements of business value of delivered work, but as Eliyahu Goldratt pointed out in his critique of the balanced scorecard, there's virtue in simplicity. Uh, throughput doesn't answer all of our questions about business value, but it's a sufficient metric for the context of evaluating the relationship of practices with productivity. Now, Little's Law is awesome because 
it's pretty easy to come off as like some kind of expert. It's very cool math. You can count on hardly anybody knowing that much about it, right? John von Neumann had said, if you want to win a debate, you just need to mention entropy because folks won't want to admit that they're not sure what it means, right? <laughs> so Little's Law is kind of like that, right? Uh, imagining, imagine that you're losing an argument from somebody, with somebody from the project management office. Not hard to do. You just let them get off their point, act as if you're agreeing with them, and then at the last minute, like it's an afterthought, ask them if they remembered to factor entropy into the estimate. Right? That'll slow them down. If you're getting pushback in an agile engagement, just start talking Little's Law and most people will back off. Right? Even if you run up against somebody who can talk the Little's Law talk, you can always fall back to pontificating on probability density functions. Right? If that doesn't work, then you can just go to the Accelerate book. I guess I'm getting a little off script here. Um, at this point in the conversation, I should probably just confess that I'm very much at risk of becoming a victim of my own expertise. I'll ask you to have a little decorum for this moment, please. <laughs> Dearly beloved, we are gathered here together today to lay to rest any chance we had to actually understand the system and content ourselves with bits and pieces of some crafty knowledge. Experts are best at planning their own funerals. We spend our whole lives trying to become experts, only to fall on our own swords. We read books and we attend the best conferences, like this one. While normal people talk about sports or how to barbecue a goat, we debate the finer points of story mapping strategies. We study hard and earn certifications. We become experts. Now all this is necessary and good so long as we don't fall into the trap of thinking that having expert knowledge is somehow the same as knowing what to do with it. Everybody else seems to know what to do with your expertise. You're supposed to solve their problems. To recommend the best solution or the most likely outcome. You're expected to act as a sort of problem solution matchmaker. Right? Many consultants just assume that's what the game is all about. Right? That's the Harry Potter charm school model of consultancy where missed deadlines can be remedied with an acceleratum charm or quality issues vanquished with a best practicum spell. Bing. We know you're not one of those coaches out there selling solutions out of a Sears and Roebuck style catalog of best practices, that you're the level-headed type, making a serious effort at using your intelligence to apply hard-earned knowledge to the problem at hand. Considering everything that you put into becoming an expert, it's only natural to have the nearly irresistible instinct to respond to the challenge of a, a specific problem with a definite solution. What kind of expert are you if you can't do that? So let's take a look at how this expert solutioning thing works. Presented with a problem, you make a scan of your extensive expertise, looking for patterns that seem to match the nature of the problem. We do this intuitional pattern matching in an instant setting the context for all of the critical thinking that follows. Most of what we think of as expert analysis is really just giving a story to our intuition. For a deep dive on what's going on here, you can start with Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. But suffice it to say that chimpanzees throwing darts do surprisingly well against experts at the top of their field. Becoming more expert doesn't seem to help that much. If chimps could learn to show up to meetings on time, they could turn out to be formidable competitors to many agile coaches, especially when you consider the arbitrage opportunities in their billing rate. Although this may seem a little demoralizing, don't give up so easily. The problem isn't that expertise is valueless. It's just that we tend to apply it in a somewhat ineffective way. Let's look at this question from a different perspective. In 1932, the American geneticist Sewall Wright developed the concept of studying evolution by studying the distribution of, or by visualizing the distribution of fitness values. So this mental model describes an immense grid called the fitness landscape, 
where each cell contains some random combination of success attributes. Most of them will be totally unworkable. Some will be viable, although destined for an early exit from the gene pool. And then some, will be, some of these combinations will be success attributes that are well suited to the environment. And somewhere in there are a few real winners. This two-dimensional grid concept is an improvement over the usual expert strategy of picking a winner, one of those grid squares. But Wright took it a step further, transforming the fitness landscape into a three-dimensional grid with the unlikely combinations rendered as troughs and the more viable combinations as peaks. Now add the dimension of time. Adding the temporal axis reflects the changing conditions of the environment. The perfect solution determined by expert analysis today may be quite unfit for purpose in tomorrow's environment. Yesterday's success criteria is old news. It turns out that the dartboard is a bit of a moving target. So now think of some problem that you're asked to solve. Consider all of the possible combinations of success criteria and then take into consideration the under -envir underlying environmental conditions, always in a state of flux. That's the fitness landscape where you have to survive and thrive. Our ability to show our clients around the peaks and valleys of their fitness landscape is a good opportunity to put some distance between ourselves and the dart throwing chimps. Any expert can land a dart on the board, but it takes a good sense of direction to navigate the fitness landscape, someone who can think in terms of the system as a whole. This mental model broadens our view to understand that systems thinking is what sets us apart. Once we grasp the complexity of the problem space, we can see the deficiency of trying to pick winners through expert analysis. Often serving up a definite solution is not nearly so viable as, as valuable as just being able to keep our clients out of the weeds. Now, the fitness landscape gives us a sense of direction, but it doesn't help much if we can't even get started. Start from where you are is not just a slogan. What's the alternative? Start from where you aren't? I suppose, that's, I suppose that's the whole idea of Sprint Zero, to emphasize that wherever it is you are, you're going to have to get down to the bus stop on time to catch the line to Sprint One. Don't be late. You'll never miss the bus when you start from where you are because you're already there. Just keep in mind that before it was a starting point, it was the end point of whatever it is that came before, and every fresh start is going to include some small measure of resistance to change. Strategies for overcoming inertia are just as important as expert knowledge of the problem domain. Now the parable of Burden's ass tells of the hungry, thirsty donkey standing exactly halfway between a rather delicious looking pile of hay on one side and a trough of fresh cold water on the other unable to decide which to go for first. Although his inability to choose will be the death of him, you could say that the donkey is in a stable state, right? We tend to think of stability as our goal, but sometimes it's what stands in the way of improvement. So while our donkey domain expert is off building a Monte Carlo simulation to work out whether the donkey's gonna die of thirst or starvation, someone comes up from behind and whacks the donkey with a two by four. It's a black swan event from the point of view of the donkey domain expert. We don't know which way the donkey's gonna go, and it turns out we don't much care. Sometimes uh, just setting things in motion is more important than knowing what precisely what the outcome is going to be. The metaphor of the gray squirrel sheds a little bit more light on our question. The story of how gray squirrels came to prevail over the native red squirrels of England is often told in the Kanban community as a metaphor of incremental evolutionary adaptation, that even a seemingly small change can bring about far-reaching results when it proves better adapted to the problems posed by the environment. But a closer look at the social and physiological dynamics of squirrels can lead us to a better understanding of what this metaphor is about the role of stressors in the fitness landscape. 
Since the days of King Alfred of Wessex, the red squirrels had been uncontested masters of English forests. And it was as early as 1870 when the Duke of Bedford brought American gray squirrels to his private zoo. But the reign of the greys did not really begin until 1911, when the Duke of Birmingham delighted guests at the wedding of some now long forgotten aristocrats with a pair of American gray squirrels, Sciotus carolinensis. Seeing the liberated gray scamper off into the woodlands of Coventry Park was a charming symbol of the happiness in store for the newlyweds, but distasteful and distressing to the incumbents, Sciotus vulgatus, the red squirrels watching from tree perches above. Something had been set in motion on that day that has caused the reds to gradually abandon their ancestral woodlands. Today, you might travel as far as Northumberland or Snowdonia before finding a family of refugee reds. It's been more than a century since that fateful wedding party, and the internet is full of inflammatory and divisive theories about why red squirrels are exiles today from their former homeland. There are those who spew their digital invective over gray squirrel aggressiveness while remaining silent about reports of equally belligerent reds. Researchers Luke Wooders and John Grinnell tried to catch the grays in the act by radio tracking the critters, publishing their results in a 1999 issue of Ethnology Journal. They concluded after dedicating two years of their lives to this observation that there was no more aggressive encounters between squirrels at the red gray site than at the red only site. Evidence that reds and grays cohabitate the same woodlands without elevated levels of conflict. Some people cite scatter hoarding or the storing of nuts in multiple places as the key advantage of the grays over the reds who go in for the local optimization of a single nut storehouse. Now, this does seem to have the same class of advantage as index funds, but as compelling as this theory is, is doubtful because the reds don't appear to be running out of nuts. Now, if you meet some old timer from the Scottish Highlands, as soon as the topic of squirrels comes, comes up, which generally won't take long. He'll be off on a jag about a pox on the red squirrels and the disease bedding Americans and how he'd shoot one as soon as look at him. So if you do run into these old timers, just, you might as well just settle in for a pint because once a Scot gets started in on squirrels, there's no stopping them. The risk is that if you hang around too long, then you're gonna end up talking about them. So, Anyway, I'm getting a little off topic here. So what was I talking about? Oh yeah, the squirrels. In the true history of gray squirrels in Britain, John Bryant notes that it has been alleged that the pox disease was transmitted by grays who are immune to the virus. In fact, out of 44 districts where red squirrels were affected between 1900 and 1920, only four had gray squirrels present. So gray squirrels as disease carriers turns out to be a bit of a red herring. Some people seem to imply that the simple fact that the Carolinuses are of American origin to be a sufficient explanation for their dominance. As you might imagine, most of these theories are simply lacking rigor. In most cases, the two species simply ignore one another. Internet trolls conveniently overlook such details as they spin their gray squirrel conspiracy theories. Red squirrels are clearly having a hard time finding a footing in their fitness landscape, so what is this gray squirrel thing all about anyway? Recently, a distinguished team of researchers provided the kind of hard data that fair-minded people have been waiting for on this question in the form of a peer-reviewed paper published in a scientific journal, the Journal of Animal Ecology, titled Stress and biological invasions introduced invasive gray squirrels increase physiological stress in native Eurasian red squirrels. These intrepid scholars put some rigor to the question by gathering red squirrel scat. In their own words, they quote, extracted glucocorticoid metabolites from fecal samples to measure whether the presence of the invasive species causes an increase in physiological stress in individuals of the native species. People do this for a living. Glucocorticoid is part of a feedback me mechanism which serves to reduce or suppress the mammalian immune system. You've got some too. 
In a healthy subject, it's just another hormone that shows up at the right time to keep the system in balance. In pharmacology, it can do the trick to put an overactive immune system response back in its place. For some reason, it's overproduced in stressful situations, so if you've ever wondered why stress can be harmful to your health, glucocorticoid could be a good place to look. Too much of this stuff floating around, and you're more vulnerable to all the things that your immune system is there to protect you from. So what conclusions did the scientists reach about these formerly fit-for-purpose English red squirrels? The presence of the stress hormone glucocorticoid was found to be three times higher in red squirrels cohabitating woodlands with grays as those who, who still lived in forests as yet unsullied by the American Carolinensis. The gray squirrels aren't stealing nuts from the natives or beating them up. They're just making them nervous, an, an effective stressor. The stress that red squirrels feel in the presence of grays results in increased levels of glucocorticoid, which suppresses the immune system, which makes them more susceptible to disease, such as squirrel pox. What British red squirrels need is not the extermination of their American cousins, but simply effective coaching to adopt practices appropriate to their maturity level, which will help alleviate their stress. Red squirrels are clearly laboring under maturity level zero, oblivious mode, and would benefit greatly from a few effective strategies, such as learning to engage in personal reflection and defining work types based on the nature of tasks. These practices are proven to reduce stress, which will bring down glucocorticoid levels and strengthen the immune system. So with proper coaching, the reds may yet recover their ancestral homes. So please put away your shotguns, and volunteer some coaching skills to help the Reds regain their footing in the fitness landscape. Now, consider if, instead of loosing the Greys back in 1911, had the Duke of Birmingham consulted with a squirrel domain expert to, about how to go about evicting the Red Squirrels from his estate, something which he did actually effectively accomplish, you can bet that the expert's recommendation to solve the Duke's problem would have involved quite a bit more effort than lifting the latch on the, ca on the cage of a couple of mail order rodents. Of course, the Duke didn't have, um, he didn't think of the red squirrels as being a problem needing solving at the time. But having the presence of mind to spin a retrospective narrative to lay claim to some eventual irrefutable outcome, that's the stuff that consulting legends are made of. Any chimp might beat you at the dartboard, but you can always come out ahead by telling the story about how your dart landed just where you intended. Armed with the secret weapon of retrospective narrative, we can apply the solution of the donkey's dilemma to nearly any challenge. A whack with a two by four, loose a pair of gray squirrels, whatever it takes to put inertia under stress, because the domain problem isn't always the biggest problem, right? It's not the real problem. The stasis that resists change is usually the tougher nut to crack. So a system which isn't under stress is one that's stable. Stability doesn't much like disruption, even when the stable state is suboptimum. As Forrest Gump observed, suboptimum is as suboptimum does. The key is not to let suboptimum settle in and get comfortable, but rather keep things in motion. No need to worry about where things will land, you can always come up with a story later to explain where you, were, that, where you were headed, where you ended up all along. If you feel that you don't have time to let your squirrels work their magic, you can always just put on your expert hat and gown and just tell people what to do. Most organizations will expect nothing less. But just keep in mind that the fact that they expect it of you doesn't mean that they'll go along with you. Colleagues from all ranks of the organization will sing Kanban Kumbaya around the campfire with you all night long and then cross shields in defense of the status quo in the morning. It's hard to get anything done in the face of inertia, so you can see why the metaphor of the gray squirrel is so powerful. But introducing stressors is not somehow your end game. When your problem is inertia, introduce a stressor to get things in motion, stir things up, trigger a response. When there's a positive response, then it's time to try to consolidate gains. And the KMM gives us a mental model for these phases, the transitional versus consolidation phase. Transitional to get things in motion, consolidation around improvements. 
Now, the idea of phases isn't the same thing of whatever, as whatever cadence that you've arrived at. It's more a reflection of the dynamics of inertia and stability. So as long as inertia is blocking improvement, you should consider that you're in a transitional phase, no matter how many cadence cycles it takes. Um, this is why retrospectives scheduled by cadence tend to be disappoint disappointing, because they're really in, uh, often a uh, premature attempt at consolidation. Folks aren't ready. You'll find that some people have a very special talent for resisting change. You know, some things just take time. But keep in mind that the great squirrels didn't conquer that rainy island in a weekend. Now, the KMM gives us another mental model to help sort out which practices tend to work better in transitional phases and which work are better suited for the consolidation phases. These are the normative versus structural changes. A normative change is a revision to policy or procedure which doesn't disrupt social structure, thus is less likely to meet resistance and more likely to build trust in the idea that change can lead to improvement. In contrast, a structural change implies some need for some adaptation to roles, responsibilities, or status of team members hence less likely to succeed without the buy-in of those who are affected. Buy-in is earned by building trust. Building trust provides a foundation to allow team maturity to grow through the self-reinforcing dynamics of the phases. Just don't lose sight of the fact that team maturity is measured in terms of increased productivity, not practice adoption. An interesting thing we found is that many of the same dynamics apply to any team, including scrum teams. The concept of pairing transitional versus consolidation phases with normative versus structural practices is a powerful model for moving things in the right direction. Of course, many of the practices of the KMM will be out of reach for scrum teams who trade off a focus on managing actual constraints for a sort of lump sum constraint of the sprint time box. It's a lower fidelity operation. But as Donald Rumsfeld observed, sometimes you have to go to war with the army you have. Whatever the specific practices you're considering, it still makes sense to ask if you should be focusing on moving the inertia needle or if the time has come to try to consolidate gains. That'll provide a context for a discussion of the normative versus structural implications of any particular practice proposal. For example, when determining when to attempt to move to, from a transitional phase to consolidation phase in Kanban, you can design pull policies and other board attributes to visualize the signal, and the turning point will be right there on the card wall, getting rid of a lot of the guesswork. Working with scrum boards without explicit whip limits or queue management, you'll have to work harder to observe other telltale signs. Thanks to the intrepid researchers from the animal ecology community, we now have some hard science to work with, how to understand how to read the dynamics of stressors. The secret of knowing when to pivot from transitional to consolidation phase depends on getting feedback that indicates that your stressors are working. This has been the secret sauce of top coaches, but now that we know about glucocorticoid, every coach can pivot like a pro. Saving thousands of hours of difficult and expensive trial and error, we now offer ScrumScat, the mobile phone app which provides real-time readings of glucocorticoid, glucocorticoid metabolite from Scrum Master Scat. Let your gray squirrels loose, set the trigger levels in the app. When Scrum Master Glucocorticoid spikes, you'll know that it's time to pivot to consolidation phase, taking the guesswork out of one of the most treacherous decisions faced by agile coaches. You can see by now that getting the right feedback is at the center of everything. So it should come as no surprise when we encounter the feedback problem at scale in scaling frameworks. We're going to have to get a lot of different feedback mechanisms right before the Agile trains will all be running on time. Now, when you bring, try to bring this topic up in the Agile community, people seem to think right away along the lines of the kind of thing that happens in a retrospective session. Now, this kind of information gathered in this way is valuable and it's important. And speaking from experience, it's an improvement over the kind of insensitivity that was the norm in pre-Agile IT departments. But there are other kinds of feedback as well. The profit and loss statement, for example. The P&L seems to be considered a bit of a relic in the age of Agile, but it has stood the test of time as a valuable feedback mechanism, especially when avoiding bankruptcy is one of your KPIs. I gained some insight into this dynamic through the story of Phineas Gage, retold by Tim Hartford in his book, Adapt. 
About 20 years before the American Civil War, Phineas was blasting rock for the Rutland and Burlington Railroad just south of Cavendish, Vermont. Phineas was, he was tamping down blasting powder in a rock bore when the metal tamping rod generated a spark which ignited the explosive dust. The rod still in the hole. At the moment when the powder ignited, in contravention to established safety protocols, Phineas was just turning to talk to his crew behind him, bringing his head inadvertently in line with the arc upon which the rod was about to embark. The steel tamping rod was a little over an inch in diameter, just over three feet long, about 80 pounds. When the rod became a rocket, the pointy end entered Phineas's open mouth, passed behind his left eye, clear through the left frontal lobe of his brain, exiting the top of his skull, clattering down among the rocks some 25 meters away, bits of gray matter still attached. Now, the unfortunate Mr. Gage had the remarkable fortune not only to survive, but remained conscious through the ordeal and was somehow able to mutter some account of the circumstances of the accident to the attending physician a half hour later, while the good doctor st st stared in disbelief at the gaping hole in the man's skull. And although the rod had carried off a not entirely insignificant portion of Phineas's brain, he recovered and went back to work, although not for that railroad. He traveled to South America, to Chile, and he took a job as a stagecoach driver on the Valparaiso-Santiago line, which is a pretty rough mountain pass, if you've ever been over that. Evidence that he continued in life as more than an invalid. Other than being blind in his left eye, he looked like the same man as before. But there was some distinctive change in behavior. Before, he had been known as a reasonable man, but Phineas missing a particular sized chunk of his brain was often belligerent and indifferent to social norms he had previously respected. In short, while he retained nearly all of the abilities of his former self, he seemed to have lost his ability to process a certain form of feedback. Now, when enterprises embark on a digital transformation odyssey, it sometimes seems as if a steel rod had been blasted through the corporate cranium, <laughs> taking out the part of the brain that processes feedback about profit and loss leaving everything else intact. Whereas before we knew vigilant guardians of the balance sheet, we find purveyors of retrospective narrative, turtles all the way down. If Agile is going to improve our, about our ability to deliver value to the business, then we should be able to tell that story of value in the P&L. Now, I get it that the legacy P&L and balance sheet structure represent obstacles in attributing costs and revenues in complex dynamic scenarios where software engineering teams ply their trade. I understand that it's not an easy problem, but papering over the misalignment between agile initiatives and the P&L is a lot like Phineas without the feedback part of his brain. You can count on him showing up to work, but you might wonder what he's capable of next. I think that some of the most important work that we have before us today is to strip away the apparent complexity around what we mean by productivity and how to measure it and to put those metrics in alignment from the pull request edge all the way through to the P&L. So time's our most valuable asset. Thanks for spending a little bit of time here with, uh, with me. Um, before we go to some discussion, we can have discussion going into lunch. Let me walk through a little bit of bibliography behind this work. I had a couple of years to kind of move beyond the base of this presentation into the problem solution of how are we going to do this? Of, of measuring productivity. And part of it is this, this is a graphic from my forthcoming book um, and another one right here, right? Um, which is uh, called The Statistical Consequences of Cattails. Uh, software engineering as if money actually matters. It's the, what the title is at this point. So, um, and it is as much fun as I've made of Little's Law and probability density functions this is a book about Little's Law and probability dens density functions, right? So, um, and the, um, the important thing is, is that, you know, every software engineer has got an origin story, right? That he was like soldered radios back together as a kid and he became, so, well, you know, what's the origin story for your average enterprise manager, right? It's watching cat videos on YouTube, is, right? <laughs> so if we're going to explain this stuff, 
then we probably ought to start with cats, right? So, you know, if we can engage them on, you know, th things like this, right? And we can teach, we, we need to teach them the difference between a fat tail curve and a thin tail curve, right? So if we, we can teach them in terms of cats, right, first, something along that. And I'm not particularly joking about that. Um, everything that you need about Little's Law is in the CAMM. You don't, mostly, you know, most of, the, most of the market is pretty low maturity level. And if you don't have work organized in terms of services and you don't have a pull-based system, you don't need Little's Law, right? It's, it's overreach, right? You need to do the service orientation pull-based system first. Um, so don't overreach. But if you do want to overreach, right, factory physics is the deep dive on Little's Law. It's really like there's no end to that. Um, if we're going to do anything, we're going to have any conversation about metrics. And, and also, if you, if you got the idea from my presentation that, I, that, I, that I'm proposing that a peer-reviewed paper in a scientific journal is proof of anything, then you've lost track of what the science journal industry has become in the recent years. Because there, anything, right, goes. And so this book is highly recommended, Calling Bullshit, not only for the science journal industry, but also for our own world of bullshit metrics, of which, I, you know, there's nothing wrong with the door. The, everybody should keep track of their DORA metrics and everything. But the, the statistical gobbledygook behind Accelerate is, you know, well, I'll leave it at that. Um, Thinking fast and slow, uh, hopefully you've, you've been through that, right? But there's, and it's been 10 years since that book has been published. The Enigma of Reason is like a follow-up book from that, that um, we, should, we should talk about that, right? That's a, very, that's a very important pair of books together there. And I guess there's a final one, this thing of like, I did a lot of reading over COVID, and the one that helped me, I think, best understand the stature of the Kanban maturity model was reading through Herbert Simon's 1960s, 1970s, Sciences of the Artificial, because the Kanban maturity model is emblematic of the science of the artificial, right? We're in this abstract knowledge work domain, and we're building something structurally that is historically unprecedented, right? The work that's going on here in this community is groundbreaking work in the history of humanity. So. And Herbert Simon laid the great, he explained a lot of how this kind of direction of it. So I'll recommend that. So again, thank you very much. Um, there's plenty more I'd love to talk about, but let's, for whatever moments we have. I think we have time for just one question. It's so like we'll David's got that. a, that's a, that's a frightening thought, right? It's like, okay, now, now what? No, the, the, <laughs> right. There'll be one other question. I just have two comments. The first quote attributed to me is actually from the, the author Joel Barker. I'll get it straight down. There does appear to be internet bots, you know, AI bots that put together these quotation websites. More than half the quotations attributed to me, I don't actually ever remember writing, publishing, <laughs> saying. Um, so a word of caution. And meanwhile, our Movisoft team in Bilbao have been using lots of cat tail, you know, lots of cat photographs to explain the tails already. So we, um, we're simpatico on that. And uh, essentially, there's a room full of um, young ladies in their 30s who do marketing for me who will help you amp the heck out of a book with a cat on the cover. <laughs> Oh, that, right. that's awesome, because I, I am dead serious about the book, right? So who has a question? Or comment? Going? Going? Anybody? Question for Michael? I guess not. But thank you very much, Michael. That was wonderfully entertaining, as always. Ah. <sighs>